Welcome to Mono and I am welcome back. We are in the middle of part four of the Maha Upanishad, starting with verse 44. Before I do though, small print. So this channel is me reading the scriptures for the very first time with you. We're doing it together. I literally just I'll pick up something, I'll just kind of briefly look at it, like how long it is or something, or or sometimes I'll read a little bit if something seems long going, okay, well, maybe this might be a good place to stop. That's it. I, I don't do any research, I do nothing. I go into these things like, sort of like, a student hearing them from the teacher for the very first time. Uh, a student doesn't sit down with, with uh, you know, Shri Shri Ravis Shankar and Shri Shri goes, today we're going to talk about the Maha Upanishad. And the student goes, oh, I know all about that. I've researched it already. No, the student's like, what's the Maha Upanishad? I have no idea. That's a rare thing nowadays. We don't really do that a lot. We tend to read the Wikipedia thing and maybe we'll catch the YouTube video and then we'll go into this. It's sort of like with movies. How many of us see a, a preview for a movie and then all of a sudden we're kind of looking at the movie I do that all the time. My girlfriend absolutely hates it, but I I like it because a lot of movies I really just don't see. And I don't want to go to movie theaters and I'm I'm not like I, I'm not a big movie guy. Uh music has always been my thing, so you know what I mean. Well that that's my long apology for basically saying this video and the next one. I've already read this part. <laughs> I have read the entire Upanishad already, record the videos, and they are uploaded in, in the queue. And it takes a little while on my computer sometimes to upload some stuff. It could be really slow. And so I started some uploads, and I went back to them the next day, and they didn't like that, and they just was like, sorry, won't, won't, hand, won't happen. So I had to cancel, and I accidentally in the process deleted two videos that had already been uploaded and processed and finished, and I, and I didn't realize it. I was like, oh shit. So I had to upload everything and make a spreadsheet of, um, <laughs> make a spreadsheet of, of stuff and go, okay. And then listen to everybody. Okay, this is, there's part one, there's part two. All right, this was that other thing to figure out what I missed. So <laughs> this and the end of part four were deleted. So I've already read the Upanishad, but I'm going back, filling in the gaps. So I'm cheating a little bit. Anyways. That's my long introduction. Thanks for sitting through that. I feel a little better now. <laughs> so here we go. Verse 44. The visible cosmos of unmoving and moving things melts away like a dream in a dreamless sleep. The wise people have attributed for empirical purposes names for the supreme being, such as Rita, Atma, Parabrahman, Truth, etc., just as armlets, etc., are only words and meanings, not different from gold, so also the magical illusion of the cosmos extended by the Supreme Being. The perceived being inside the visible world is called bondage. In the absence of the visible, he is realized. What is called the visible is the projection like the universe is you and I. The illusion of the world is spread only by the mind, as long as it happens. This is no liberation. The cosmos is spread through the mind by the self-born supreme being. So the visible cosmos is mental in nature. There is no real mind. It is only the flash of things. Know the mind to be only ideation. Understand that where there is ideation, there is mind. Mind and ideation are never different. When the mass of ideation slips away, only the pristine nature remains. When the excitement of the visible, as an I and you are the cosmos, dies down, only the soul condition, that pristineness, remains. At the achievement of the great dissolution, when all visible creation becomes to be known as non-existent, only tranquility remains. There exists the unborn, divine, unailing, shining being, the unsetting sun, forever, the maker of all, declared to be the supreme self, from whom words turn away, who is realized only by the liberated person, whose names like individual selves are assumed, 
not natural. The three kinds of ether, namely the mental, spiritual, and gross, know the spiritual one to be emptier than the other two. When the perception passes from one place to another, the interval is known as the spiritual region in a moment when you reach the stage where all ideations are rejected. Then surely you will reach the state of all quiet. The condition is samadhi, which exudes bliss and contains the essence of detachment, of nobility and beauty. When joy arises strongly by the realization of the falseness of the visible world and like and dislike thin away, this realization is indeed the knowledge and its object, spiritual in nature. Only that is the soul state. All else is false. Know the world to be an illusion. Airavata in rat is confined to a corner of a mustard. A mosquito fights with a group of lions inside an atom. Meru, put inside a lotus, is pat out by a bee. Only the mind made impure by involvement is worldly life. The same mind is said to be the end of worldly existence when freed from them. An embodied being attained that condition being rooted over by the mind, freed from bodily tendencies. He is not smeared by the body's attributes. I am that mind which turns an aeon into a moment and vice versa. One cannot realize truth without desisting from bad conduct, without calmness and concentration, but only through enlightenment. One fears never and from nothing on knowing the nature of the self as bliss unequal, attributeless in one mass of truth and consciousness that is beyond all that is beyond, greater than the greatest, lustrous, and eternal in nature, wise, ancient being, worshipped by all gods. As a rule, I am Brahman. These words are for the liberation of the great, whereas in not mine and mine give liberation and bondage, respectively. The creation of the world is assumed by God, starting with the vision and ending with entry, from generation to dissolution, in the form of Shiva, Ishvara, etc. The nature of the animate and the inanimate worldly life from waking to liberation is projected by Shiva. Schools of thought from Tranakshiketa to the Yoga depend on Ishvara's illusion. From the Lokayata to Sankhya schools, they depend on Shiva's illusion. Hence, the aspirants to liberation should not consider these schools being illusory, but the essential truth about Brahman is to be considered with steadiness. Only one who looks upon everything in relation to consciousness is the knower proper, Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahman. Without a good preceptor's grace, it is hard to give up objects, to see the truth, and to realize the pristine state. The pristine state is naturally realized by a yogin who has power generated in him and has given up all worldly activity. When a man perceives even a little difference between these, then, there will be fear in him, doubtless. A person with wisdom as the eyes sees the Supreme as present everywhere. The Supreme Being is knowledge alone, so a mortal becomes immortal only by vision of Brahman. When the great beyond is seen, the knot of the heart snaps, all doubts are smashed, and all worldly activities die away. Be devoted to Savid with single attention, giving up the non-spiritual attitude and unaffected by the condition of the world. In a desert, all the water is an illusion. Only the desert is real. Similarly, on reflection, all the three worlds are nothing more than chit. He who remains giving up what is implied and expressed is Shiva himself, the best of the Brahman knowers. That undecaying being is the substratum of all without comparison beyond worlds and mind, eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, and subtle. The mind and the world are only the blooming of the Supreme Being. Worldly life is reduced by restraint of the mind and non-restraint of the spirit. We're ending here. The next video we'll pick up with verse 88. And that last line was a great one. Worldly life is reduced by the restraint of the mind and non-restraint of the spirit. Restraint of the mind and non-restraint of the spirit. Wow, sort of implying. No, it's not implying. It's just telling us straight out the opposite is true. When we restrain the spirit and we let the worldly life go, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. 
And I always think of then people who let the worldly life go and have no spirit. They, they have no God. They, they have nothing. Or maybe they've decided, and I've known people who said this, I'll worry about it when I'm old. Don't do that. All that lost time. I wish I'd read these texts years ago. Here I am in my 40s. I feel old and I'm reading them now. I don't have the time. I wish I'd pursued activities earlier. And I didn't. I wouldn't want to wait till I was 80, given I don't know when I'm going to die. Maybe I'll die at 60. Maybe I'll die at 80. Why wait? So people who don't have spirit, I hurt for you. I really do. Uh, I really hurt. It's not... I. I feel, I grew up in a home that was an atheist home, devout atheist. God was, I don't know, it was like just a fantasy fiction, you know. Might as well believe in Stephen King books. And then I discovered God in college, and it changed my life. Now, it wasn't an easy path, and I went here and there and whatever. And I got a lot of education. I wish I hadn't on some level. I wish I'd studied and been committed to something somewhere else, but that's okay. And I don't really want to say that at times when I didn't believe in God, life was horrible. And when I did believe in God, life was amazing. It, it didn't really work like that. But when I didn't believe in God, I did feel cut off from things and incomplete at times and hopeless. Because by not having God, I had to find something to give my life meaning. I needed something in my life that was greater than me. And I would write books. Uh, they wouldn't sell. I'd write another one. I did theater and played music. I did all sorts of things. You know, did some stupid stuff to try to find something. And I see a lot of people in the world doing this. A lot of people. Now, that doesn't mean if you find God, your life will have meaning. Actually, I will say that at times it didn't have meaning. I had to find where I fit. And I bounced around with all different, explored different religions and things and from studying Judaism going to synagogue, which was great, to Raal, you know, the, the French prophet who's really into uh, sex and computers and technology. I read his books and I was potentially going to meet up with some of his followers. So I've been all over trying to find what fit, and then when I found it, it's just like, boom, that's it. Like, that's it. I, I had it, and it was fulfilling, and I love it, and I love doing this, and I feel so much value in this. and. And I think it's made my life better. And have I realized everything this Upanishad writes about? The illusion and the worldly life? No, because, well, you can see the worldly life around me. I'm not hiding it here. But I'm trying to keep that flame burning, you know, as a reminder. In this, in this worldly life, keep that flame burning that there's more here. Does that make sense? Anyways, uh... I just rambled on about something and, and totally didn't know where that was coming from, didn't see that coming, and this was not in the original video that was taken. I don't even remember what I said in that video. Anyways, thank you for hanging out with me. Um, thank you, sincerely. And we'll finish part four in the next video. And we'll work our way through this Upanishad. I will not tell you how many videos it ended up being, but it's the biggest one to date. <laughs> it's no surprise there. I do want to say it is kind of cool rereading this. This is this is this is kind of neat rereading it. I'm, I'm seeing different things, and I don't give myself that opportunity on this channel. But I would encourage it for you if you hear me say something and read about something, go back, read it on your own. Um, it, I, I think it is good if if something grabs you, you know. Take a second, take a second notice with it. I don't think uh, reading a second time channel would be quite as popular as reading the first time. <laughs> not that this is the most popular channel in the world as it is, but so I'm not, I'm not doing that. But definitely, yeah, I, I see it reading it again. It's worth it, particularly for something like this, which I'm actually really enjoying this upon a shot. All right. So that being said, <laughs> here I am making this long video. Thank you for hanging with it. Harry Krishna, Harry Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Harry Harry, Harry Rama, Harry Rama, Rama Rama, Harry.